have a, um, a question I'm going to ask and I'm going to jump into the chat to tackle some of those. Um, what resources, because you've been talking a little bit about some of these, so I just thought that would be a good question to pivot to. What resources can our audience utilize when developing their brand or making money from social media? Do you have any quick ones that they, I know you talked about the, the organic ones that are already in the, um, the software that you're using anyway, but any one that stands out to you that that's kind of your go-to or- um, Shay said it earlier, Google AdSense, mm -hmm. um, signing up for that and connecting it to your blog, um, to your YouTube channel. Um, I get, I almost forget it that it's there, but I'll get a monthly payment from Google AdSense just for the views that I get on YouTube. So that's one, it doesn't cost anything to sign up. Um, you just start building, you know, your following and you get paid for the ads that they insert on your videos or the views on your website. Tools, if you're looking for tools necessarily, I swear by Canva. And I know a lot yes. of people probably know about Canva now, but you can make intros for your YouTube channels and outros. You can make Instagram story, like they have templates for fun little, you know, ways to create different graphics. They have, uh, I mean, I, I use Canva for thumbnails for literally everything. I do pay $12.95 a month for it, obviously, because I am using the paid version, the pro version, which you get a lot of stuff for with that. But Canva, I swear by for creating all things graphics. I like InShot for, I don't know if they have it for, I use, I'm an, I'm an Apple girl, so I don't know if they have it for Android, but I use InShot for editing reels or any type of short form content. So I swear by those two. iMovie, if you are an Apple product person like me, that comes standard with any device that you purchase, including an iPhone. So you can use that for editing, especially landscape type of content. Um, those are kind of the three resources. I currently use LumaFusion for iPad for editing YouTube videos, but you will need to have an iPad and to purchase LumaFusion to be able to edit using LumaFusion. But those are my go-to if when it comes to tools specifically. If I'm doing anything with social media, I don't even edit. I don't even use Instagram for editing or anything. I pretty much create everything in InShot or elsewhere. And then I take it to Instagram just because for me to like well they have a bunch of different more features than instagram really but also it's i feel like more user friendly than instagram instagrams are always crashing when i'm trying to edit something or something's wrong with it so i just start an in shot and then i just take it from there but those are like my go-to tools that i use anytime i'm creating content 100 of the time when i'm creating content Oh, and speaking of social media crashing, having an email list that exists outside of social media, whether you use MailChimp, Constant Contact, you want to drive people to sign up for your email list. That way you can stay in communication with those that are following you if there is a mishap or you never know. I've had my account hacked before, but then I learned this was early on, but I learned that two-step authentication rule, like those security measures, having that to protect, you know, what you built, at, honestly, and knowing that you don't own that platform. But if you, you know, get an email list and you're pay paying for that list serve, then you have a way to communicate, you know, with your audience in the event something happens or just even outside of social media, having that communication especially as you're building up, once you get to, you know, having a bunch of different followers, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions, you might be able to work with Instagram or Facebook or whomever to try to get your account back. But, you know, you don't want the work that you've done if you haven't reached 10,000 or 20,000 or 30,000 to be in vain. So having a website where your products can live or just different information can live and people can go there to um, sign up for your email list and, just having that because you own that technically, but Instagram and YouTube and Facebook and all of that, you know, you're just using their platform. And if something goes wrong or if it's down or something like that, which, you know, they, they do a good job of keeping it up, obviously, but there are times when they are not doing what they're supposed to be doing or you're hacked or something. So definitely having something outside of that. That's what I think that's probably my number one tip is having a website, even if you don't have a bunch of going on there, but just enough to just you know, if you don't want to put a lot of focus and energy into it, but just something that people can go to, to find your Instagram or your Facebook or just whatever it is that you have going on. It's just a landing spot 
for people to learn about you and what you offer when it comes to social media. That's my number one tip also. Thank you. I'm combining two questions. So There's going to be a bunch, but um, they tie in very well to um, each other. So Jada's question was, how are you able to maintain or foster creative thinking in the industry of entrepreneurship and social media? And then Justin's question um, kind of feeds into that. Any, any recommendations for how to plan your content? Do you use a tool, a notes app, anything like that? So um, I think they're kind of feeding potentially to each other. So how do you want to tackle that? Um, I was looking so, for the first one. I will so share. So she's I'll, way off. Um, I, I'll copy her question again. Oh, okay. This we'll way up. Again. Can you jog my memory of what you said? How, um, so Jada's question is, how are you able to maintain or foster creative thinking in the industry of entrepreneurship and social media? Um, for that, I would say, well, there's two parts of it. I always say that there's, you know, two things can be true for everything. But I feel like if you really look at social media, a lot of people kind of are recycling the content, meaning that a lots of people may be creating content about I don't know, a day in the life or whatever the case is. So part of it is really going, you know, taking part in trends and looking for those trends and seeing what's happening and taking part in those. You are your own, you are the creativity, you are authenticity. So someone may not be able to deliver a message in the exact same way that you do. But for the most part, a lot of it is, you'll see a lot of the same types of content being created, the same things, I guess one might say. You know, when it comes to YouTube, there are a lot of people talking about money and hair and nails and um, doing vlogs and all of that type of stuff. And people are going to be drawn to your content just based on who you are. So your authenticity always have to has to show through. So while we do want to be authentic to ourselves and switch up things and try to be unique, the fact of the matter is when it comes down to the things that you see across social media and the trends that you see, it's not a bad idea, bad idea to try to, you know, get in, take part in those trends. Obviously, you don't want to replicate someone's content completely or whatever, but your day in the life is probably not going to look exactly like someone else's day in the life vlog. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And then also for me for planning, um, I actually only plan content for YouTube and I post on Wednesdays tomorrow and then on the weekend. So Saturday or Sunday. And so what I like to do is if I'm on top of things, I'll on top of things, I'll film two videos in one sitting. But otherwise, I have to film on Mondays after work. And then on Tuesdays, I edit after work. And then on Wednesdays, I publish the video at whatever time. It really doesn't really matter. Um, I do know that per my analytics, my audience members are active, pretty m most active from 12 p.m. Eastern Standard until like 9 p.m. So, you know, I try to post sometime during there. But of course, YouTube videos just live on YouTube anyway. So I'm not too strict about that. And then I kind of repeat the same process to get out my next video for the weekend. So I know there was one question somewhere. I think maybe it was on the, the list that you sent us, but I do try to, I think I dedicate about 10 hours per week to creating YouTube content. And I like to keep it at that because well, <laughs> I like doing a bunch of other things like, you know, going to the club and doing other chaotic things outside of creating content because that's just the life that I live. But <laughs> I try to keep it to about 10 hours per week when it comes to creating content. And I feel like that's a sweet spot. I can, you know, hang with my husband, and my friends, my family members and do all the other different types of things that I enjoy doing while also, you know, tending to my hobby whenever I'm whenever I have that system set in place. So I'm pretty, I'm very rigid when it comes to creating content. For Instagram, I just create it whenever I feel like it. There is no rhyme or reason to when I'm posting on Instagram. It's just whenever I'm like, oh, this is a good little piece of content to film. Let me do that because I can't, I mean, if I were full-time, I could do more, but I just have to, you know, have some balance. So that's kind of my approach. Yeah, I would I definitely piggyback off of a lot of what Shay said. Um, keeping organized with the content calendar is key for me um, to know what I'm posting on what days. Um, I've gotten to a point with the following that I do have some flexibility, but I just try to give myself off days because um, it's content that I love. So it's, and it's a lot of shared content in addition to unique content that I'm creating um, so I can 
I could post all day if I really wanted to, but I don't do that. I like limit the amount that I'm posting and then I take off on the weekends, like Saturday and Sunday. That's like family, me time, hanging out with my friends, you know, doing that sort of thing and giving myself a break. I'm like, I used to think I had to post seven days a week and now I'm just like, no, I can have time off. People, though, that audience will come back, you know, on Monday when I'm ready to dive back into it. So I definitely try to have a content calendar and schedule things out as much as I can. Um, and what she said about looking at trends, I think it's, we've said the niche word a lot. And I think that when you stick to that, it makes it even easier for you to find trends even within your industry. So if you're in food or beauty or whatever the case is, you can find a lot of trends a lot faster because you've narrowed what you're even searching for. Um, and it's easier to figure out you know, what makes sense and to kind of drive your creativity. And, you know, a trend may make you think of a trend that you come up with on your own. It might say, you know what, this is cool, but maybe it could be that way or making it specific, you know, to more specific to your audience, um, tailoring content. Um, but you can always find ideas. I think, you know, we live in a time now where technology has taken over in so many ways in our everyday life. And, I mean, there's always an opportunity for content creation. You don't want it to overwhelm you where you're feeling like I have to always think about, you know, being a content creator. You want to absolutely live your life and, you know, have your breaks and detach from it as need be. But content, I think even now going into like, I think when Instagram first started, a lot of things were about aesthetics and things being perfect and, you know, so well produced and Photoshopped and all of that. And I feel like now, content is becoming people want more real raw authentic content which is great because for the content creator you're not having to worry so much about heavily editing everything you can just get like real time photos and you know just get a nice shot you know put a cool caption or take a cool quick video i mean even like for me like since i'm in the hair industry like if i go to the salon I might get a quick before of my hair, a little after. I can edit that together in reels and then use that same video for TikTok. And that's the thing too. You can use a lot of content across all social media platforms. So you're not having to feel like I have to create something different for everyone. And when you're first starting out, you want to test all of the platforms that are available because one, they're free. And two, you just never know where your audience will live. You know, they may be more Instagram followers. They may be more on TikTok. I have a friend of mine that's a makeup artist. And I think she has maybe five to 10,000 Instagram followers. But she started talking about health and fitness on TikTok. Now her TikTok has over 800,000 followers. So you just never know like where your audience will land. So I think when you're just, you know, getting your content out there, just try everything you know, create boundaries for yourself so that you're not, you know, stressing out. And the main thing is don't get so stuck on followers and don't get so stuck on that part. Like just get stuck on doing things that you enjoy doing and posting about things that are, you know, authentic to you because your online tribe, they will find you, especially if you're using hashtags that are specific to the content. People that are like-minded will find you so don't get so caught up in in that hype and know that even with monetization, with which with Risha was talking about, and you know, monetizing your platform and your content, um, brands are not always looking for 10,000 plus followers. You know, you have a lot of influencers that may have a thousand followers, but guess what? Those 1,000 followers purchase everything that they put out. They're really highly engaged and active. So you know, just don't get caught up in that and don't make it a high pressure situation for yourself. Allow it to grow organically and find your rhythm. And listen, 10 years later, I'm still pivoting. Like now, I mean, it was short hair. You see me with a long ponytail right now. I've pivoted into like short hair, black hairstyles and hairstylists. I'm like, I'm evolving as a person. So my brand is starting to evolve with me. And people love a journey. They love to get on the ride. So don't feel like things have to be perfect the first time you put it out. Allow them to grow and build with you. And they'll appreciate it and support you more because you're being authentic. And my last thing that I want to share, just a piggyback, is that when I know we've been talking about 
you know, doing things that we can control and trying to set boundaries and all of that stuff. But I feel like the important thing to remember too is that you can only worry about or focus on what you can control. So you can control the type of content that you create and what you share in your content and all of that, what the aesthetic is, if it's short form, if it's long form, if it's for Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, but you cannot control views, you cannot control monetization, you cannot control followers or anything like that. So while we all want everything that I just mentioned to be on the up, you know, on the rise, we can't necessarily control that. So it doesn't behoove anyone to spend a bunch of time trying to figure out how to, you know, engage more followers or get more views and, and all of that stuff, because it's not really that helpful. It's something that's outside of your control. So the the key point, I guess, is if you focus on what you can control, then, you know, maybe you will be able to yield the results, which I think everybody can say that when they started social media, you know, a lot of us did not think that we would go on to do it full-time or create a brand from it or a business or make money from it, especially back in the day, folks were creating content just as a hobby, not because they thought that they would be rich off of it. And so that is kind of what holds true. And I feel like that's a common theme that you can only focus on, you know, who you are and how you present and the content that you create and when you create content and when you share it, the rest of that stuff, you just have to hope will follow and that it'll eventually, you know, be up to par. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. I know we have about six minutes left. I have about two or three more questions. You'll see how we can, we'll, we'll stop where we can. <laughs> but um, this is um, the more we, we sometimes have keyboard warriors um, that are there in the social media space. And so I have a question to ask in terms of how do you deal with nasty or negative commenters? Like any advice for um, our audience in terms of that? Block and delete. <laughs> It's really that simple, honestly. I mean, you know, I get it. Sometimes it's hard to not want to engage, especially when you're passionate about anything that you're doing and you feel like someone's coming, you know, for your art or your passion. But it's really not that deep. Half the time people are just trolling and looking for the reaction. So spend time engaging with the positive commentary and the constructive commentary. Because um, one thing I will say, like, even with my page, there may be people that will comment that they don't like a particular hairstyle. To me, that's fine. You can say, this is not for me, or I don't like this. But what I don't allow is for you to attack the person that's in the video or the photo, um, or say anything that's derogatory or disrespectful. I try to keep my community a positive and safe space for people. And you as the creator can control that. And the simplest way is just to block and delete those people that get out of hand. Or if you want to give them an opportunity, say, hey, this is a positive space. And if you can't respect it, like I'll have to restrict you or block you and you can give them a warning. But honestly, if they're like out of hand and I know it's a troll, I'm just blocking you, deleting you and going on about my day. I was going to say there's a difference between criticism and trolling. And if people are calling you ugly and stupid and dumb and just like, you know, being hurtful, then there's no point to even have them around because they're literally just being mean. But people can have a different opinion from me. And I don't, I don't not, you know, deleting their comment or upset with them because they can have a, an opinion that differs from mine. They don't have to agree with every single thing that I post or publish or whatever, but people who, you know, it's, it, just like in real life, people can agree, disagree with me and that's fine. We don't, we're not going to agree on everything, but if people, I wouldn't have people in my space who are calling me names that are hurtful or being mean to people in my comment section and all of that. So I just apply the same principles that I do in real life <laughs> to, to yeah. social media. So sometimes people do have to get um, removed, especially like spam folks to the spammers. They're annoying. They have to get blocked regularly. You know, nobody wants to deal with that. So same type of, same type of deal. If, if they're really being hurtful, you don't have to just have them around and get an opportunity to treat you like garbage, just delete their comments and block them. Thank you. So, um, do you, so do you have any predictions or thoughts or, um, related to any potential shifts that you may be seeing related to the influencer marketing in the coming future for audience to actually be aware of or think through? I, oh, I can speak to my space. Um, in beauty specifically, I just see 
that people are just getting even more less filtered and just more real when it comes to you know beauty and being open to different forms of beauty um and what that really means you know and the content doesn't have to be perfect all of the time like i've said this you know before but that's really what i'm seeing just that shift in heavily curated like you know content to more organic in the moment you know real content and you can have like a mixture of both it's whatever you know you feel is best to display your brand because I will say sometimes it depends on your goal like if you're maybe a photographer or something like that and your goal for social media is to promote your photography services then yeah, your Instagram probably should look like a portfolio, you know, like, cause you're trying to attract people to your work. Um, but if you're more lifestyle, then, you know, you're giving more lifestyle. And I think, you know, influencer marketing, social media as a whole is still so new, even though it's been around for some, a little bit of time, it's still like fairly new in regards to the potential, but we're seeing you know, influencers get like major deals, you know, with huge corporations. And so I don't think it's dying down, but I think that brands are being more specific about who they partner with and making sure that person really resonates with their brand and that their audience is engaged with their content. Um, I think the days of an influencer just being able to put hashtag ad on every little thing and just post and the brand is fine with that, whether it performs well or not, I don't think is going to be the case. I think they're going to want to see the analytics behind posts even more and to see if there's real traction and maybe even tier the level of budget they give a content creator based on that engagement. Because when you're talking specifically about influencing and monetization, that that's the goal for the brand. They want to convert to sales. They want to convert, you know, more followers to their brand. That's what their goal is. So if you're not converting, then those partnerships probably won't last very long. Thank you. Any thoughts, Shay? Mm, I think she no. did that answer justice, <laughs> that question justice. <laughs> So as we close, um, there may be some thoughts that you have, um, words of advice to give our budding social media influencers on the call. And so any thoughts you wanna share? You wanna um, share? I guess my first tip of course is to pick a niche. Um, I would say that there are people out there who have learned strategies that can be helpful. Yeah. So I just don't really see the point of when you're trying to get into something, especially now that most influencers know what they're talking about, you know, seven, eight years ago, maybe they didn't, but now most of us have a clue. So I think paying for different types of services, whether that's coaching or some kind of ebook or something, some stuff, obviously, I don't, I don't agree with everybody just selling everything just to make a dollar. And then the content isn't that great, but there are people and services and resources out there that you can pay for to make your life a hundred times easier. Um, like I said, like Canva, even that's something that's not actually paying a person necessarily, but that's a resource that if you pay for it each month and you use it to its full potential, that is going to help you create those high quality thumbnails because they have templates that you can you know, choose from. So basically doing research and paying people or paying for services that are going to help you to learn skills fast rather than spending years trying to learn how to perfect the thumbnail or trying to perfect something when you can actually pay someone, hopefully not too much money to learn that or pay for a service or a tool so you can learn that skill and you know really dive in there instead of spending years not really knowing what you're doing. I feel like those days are gone and behind us since a lot of there are a lot of resources out there right now. So I'd say that's probably my number one tip in addition to niching down and not trying to do everything. I think having a plan going into it is best right now. I don't know that people, I feel like people who don't really know why they might want to do social media or, you know, be a, an influencer. I don't know that them not having an idea about what they want to do is really helpful. I think if you know what kind of content you want to create and how you want to show up online or in the virtual space, I think that's better. And I think that helps to uh, have a plan for what type of content you want to share and all of that. I just feel like that's a better approach than just 
you know, going out there and hoping for the best. So I would say those are probably my two main tips for aspiring social media influencers. Thank you. Just a few quick um, tips I can give to, you know, elaborate on what she said. Listen, consistency. You can't say, oh, I've been, um, you know, promoting my content for a month and I've posted twice this month and nobody's following me. No one's engaging with me. I'm like, well, you're not really posting often enough or being consistent about it or you posted one month and then two months later is your next post and if you're trying to especially make it a career and monetize it you have to be consistent you know with posting content and testing content um so that would be you know my first tip there um then also build community and how do you do that you engage with other people if you have like-minded you know, content creators or people that you admire out there that may be in spaces that you want to be in, like their content, comment and tell them how much you enjoy their content, follow them. I think they're kind of, it's always like, it's to each, to each their own, but it's always kind of weird to me when people are like, I'm just going to have, I'm just going to follow zero people and let everyone follow me. And then like, I don't really kind of, unless you're like, some huge star like yep, Halle right. Berry or something and even <laughs> she follows a bunch of people it's like you know how do you expect people to want to build community with you if you're not willing to build community with them so engaging with other people and with other accounts that's a great way to gain followers because you just never know who might say oh this person left a really great comment let me look to their page I page stock all the time I'm always looking for like cool people in my space to follow and don't be afraid to do the first follow. It's almost like a first date. Don't be afraid to ask that person out, like shoot your shot, follow them, like their content. And you never know, they might look at your page and say, oh, that person's cool too, let me follow back. And don't be afraid you know, to reach out via social media, even if it's just to say, hey, I enjoy your content. It doesn't have to always be about asking for something or the first DM is like, let's collaborate. Maybe just start with, hey, I really enjoy your content. Keep going. You know, simple things like that are really helpful and they help, you know, open up, you know, the dialogue between other creators and, you know, reach across. You don't always have to reach up, like look at other content creators that are your same age within your same circle, figure out how you guys can collaborate because everyone can bring something to the table to make what you're doing even better. Thank you so much. So I'm going to ask you to put a one in the chat to say thanks to Shay and Tahira for being here today. We want to um, thank them for their knowledge, um, the input that they had, and the advice that they were um, they gave out. That's been super helpful. And so, um, and you see the ones coming up to say thank you so much for just all of that. Um, we will have this recording um, sent out to you. And so keep an eye on your inbox in the next couple of weeks. Um, we'll get that out to you. But thank you again. I'm going to be on here until everyone signs off. But that's it for today. Thank you so much again, Shay, and Tahira for being here for our very first social media influencer fireside chat. Thank you. Thank you. I love Bye. it. <laughs> Have a good one. <laughs> Bye. You too. Bye.